Hi everyone, my name is Erica Pate and I'm a fruit crop specialist with the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. In this presentation I will discuss different strawberry leaf diseases, fruit rots and viruses and how to scope for them. This is part of the 2020 Strawberry and Raspberry IPM workshop. A live online webinar is taking place on Tuesday, May 12th from 1 to 3 p.m. So make sure to register for that one beforehand. And check out the other presentations on this YouTube channel for Strawberry and Raspberry IPM. My contact information will be at the end of this presentation if you have any questions or wish to contact me. To begin, when you are scouting the field, scan the field for areas of stunted plants, wilted plants, chlorosis, or necrosis. There is another presentation on our YouTube channel, Diagnosing Strawberry Root Pests, that covers root diseases that you might see causing stunting and wilting, including black root rot and Phytophthora crown rot. Check out the Strawberry and Raspberry IPM playlist on this channel to find this presentation. Some cultivars are more susceptible to or more resistant to certain diseases, so you may want to scout cultivars separately. Walk the block in a zigzag pattern like an X, Z, 8, N, or W, stopping several times to assess the plant. Check all suspicious patches that you see when you scan the field and are walking through it. Stop and check fruit and leaves throughout the canopy. And make sure to check both sides of the leaves. The first disease I will cover today is angular leaf spot. Angular leaf spot is a bacterial disease, and you'll see the symptoms on the leaves and calyx. Tiny angular spots are evident on the underside of the leaves. These spots look wet when viewed from above, but are translucent when held up to the light. The spots enlarge into angular shaped, dark green and eventually dark brown to black spots limited by small veins. Bacteria ooze out of these spots in humid conditions and when it dries out it will leave a white flaky residue. Lesions expand and join together to become irregular reddish brown spots with necrotic areas. Infected sepals turn brown or black leaving the fruit unmarketable like you can see in this picture. To scout for angular leaf spot, begin pre-bloom, continue through bloom, and then in late summer or fall, checking new plantings, and pay close attention to fields after irrigation for frost protection. And some frost has gone on this season already, so make sure to pay close attention to those areas. Bacteria spread around the plants into new uninfected plants by splashing rain or irrigation. Keep in mind that this disease can be present all season long. Conditions that favor angular leaf spot developing include cool, wet days, with a high around 20 degrees and lows around zero. And cool spring conditions with frequent rainy periods are ideal for development, and disease pressure will be highest where frost protection has occurred. When temperatures warm up and dry up, the disease will slow down until later in the summer or fall. Next up is common leaf spot. Common leaf spot appears as small purple round spots on the upper surface of leaves. It can infect the fruit, the calyx, trusses, pedials, or runners. The center of these spots will gradually turn brown, then gray, and eventually white, as you can see in this picture. Scope for leaf spot after prolonged rainy periods, high humidity, up to 98 to 100%, and warm temperatures. Leaf spot needs at least 12 hours of leaf wetness to become infected. Look at middle aged leaves to assess the damage.
We've covered leaf spot, leaf scorch, and angular leaf spot, and now we're going to move on to leaf blight. Leaf blight is distinguishable from the other leaf diseases by this characteristic V-shaped lesion at the leaf edge that you can see here. The symptoms begin as one to six reddish to purple spots on the leaf that then expand and develop into zones. In this picture, you can see the purple reddish outer margin, light brown inner zone, and dark brown central zone that look like a V. High temperatures and damp weather cause spores to ooze from fungal bodies, and splashing water enables the spores to reach new leaf tissue. Germination occurs when there is water available on the leaf and fruit surface. Scout for leaf blight a few days after a rainy period that is followed by warm, humid weather during pre-bloom and post-harvest. Okay, we're going to move on to powdery mildew now, which is a common disease that day-neutral growers in particular will typically control for throughout the season. Symptoms include white patches of mildew and curled leaf edges. The lower leaf surface may have purple to reddish gray blotches, and the upper leaf surface may develop red speckling and purple discoloration. In Ontario, fruit and flower infection isn't common, but can occur on some varieties, which will reduce yield and quality. Uh, powdery mildew on fruit will cause the berries to be smaller, seedy, and unmarketable. You can see some of the symptoms I just mentioned in this photo as well. On that lower surface is that purple to gray blotching. On the upper surface is the speckling. And you can see that the entire leaf's leaf edges are curled out. Powdery mildew is caused by a fungus that, unlike other fungal diseases, does not need free moisture to infect. High humidity and warm weather from 15 to 27 degrees Celsius are conducive to powdery mildew development. So symptoms are typically most apparent in mid to late summer when cooler nights and high humidity provide these good conditions for infection. Day neutrals are harvested throughout the summer and into the fall when these conditions are most often present. So pay close attention to the day neutral fields you are scouting. Make sure to also scout for leaf infections in new plantings and after harvest in renovated June bearing, June bearing fields. Scout when days become short and when night temperatures become cool. Seascape, which is a day neutral variety, and Cavendish, which is a June bearing variety, in particular susceptible varieties. So make sure to keep an eye on these ones. Now next up is anthracnose. Anthracnose is a serious fungal fruit rot disease in Ontario, but it can also infect crowns, runners, flowers, and leaves. Anthracnose will cause brown or black sunken lesions on petioles, runners, crowns, and berries, and can kill flowers. Here you can see the fruit damage, leaving this distinct, round, dark, sunken lesion. And note how it is very distinct lesion, which you will be able to use to distinguish from other fruit rots that I will speak about today. And you may be able to see salmon spores in the lesion. Anthracnose is very weather dependent. It is favored by warm, humid weather and splashing rain or irrigation, especially between bloom and harvest. Day neutrals are more susceptible to this disease because they bloom and are harvested throughout the summer when these hot, humid conditions are more often present and because they are typically produced on plasticulture, which favor the, spore, the rain splash spore dispersal. Look for brown dried up blooms and brown lesions on green and ripening fruit. Move on to botrytis, which is the most destructive and widespread disease of strawberries in Ontario. It can infect leaves, runners, blossoms, and berries. Infected flower petals were will turn brown, and gray mold may develop on the blossoms. Where anthracnose is particularly a concern in day neutral production, botrytis is a concern for June bearing strawberries and day neutral strawberries. Symptoms can develop pre harvest and the diseased tissue on the berries produces gray-white fungal growth. The fruit will turn light brown and become misshapen. Notice that these are, there are no distinct borders, unlike the anthracnose fruit rot lesions. Symptoms are often associated with the calyx, as shown in this picture here. A massive gray mold can cover the entire berry, and infected berries will eventually become dried and mummified. Botrytis fruit rot is also a disease in raspberries, which I will cover in our webinar on Tuesday. 
To scout for botrytis, look in the center of the rose, pay attention to the temperature, because moderate temperatures from 15 to 25 degrees Celsius, high relative humidity, and surface wetness during flowering are optimum for botrytis. Botrytis spores are dispersed by wind or splashing rain and need water to germinate in a period of wetness that varies with the temperature. Young buds in open bloom are very susceptible to infection. Infection can remain dormant in immature fruit that then becomes more aggressive as the fruit ripens, which is why when you see botrytis, it is highly correlated to the amount of rainfall 11 to 30 days prior to harvest, which is when bloom typically occurs, that 30 days before harvest. Move on to another fruit rot, leather rot, which is caused by the fungus Phytophthora cactorum, which is the same fungus that causes Phytophthora crown rot, although both diseases may not occur at the same time or place. I spoke about Phytophthora crown rot in another presentation, Diagnosing Strawberry Root Pests, which is posted on the same YouTube channel, so make sure to check that one out if you want to learn about Phytophthora crown rot. Infection of leather rot usually occurs when the berries come into contact with soil, particularly after heavy rain. Leather rot can infect strawberry bloom and green or mature fruit. Infected flowers will turn brown and die. Green fruit will become hard and leathery. And ripe fruit may turn brown or purple and is often softer than healthy berries. Infected berries can eventually become brown, dried, and leathery. Slicing berries open will reveal darkened inner tissue and infected fruit will develop a bad taste and smell if you are brave enough to taste one. To scout for leather rot, pay close attention to fields that had standing water, a heavy rain, or were over-irrigated. Spores are spread through the air by wind or rain and affect fruit most readily under wet conditions that persist for a few hours between 15 and 28 degrees Celsius. Ex expect to find problems where the straw is thin or washed away, exposing the blossoms and fruit to soil. So we have covered leaf diseases and fruit rots, and now I'll switch gears and cover strawberry viruses. So a few years ago, Ontario strawberry growers started to notice that their fields were not lasting the three to four years they expected, and instead they were only getting one or two harvests out of their June barren fields. And we found out that this was because of strawberry viruses, which were decreasing the vigor and lifespan of these fields. And these plants would go into the winter looking good, full, uh, looking very healthy, and then they would come out in the spring um, with reduced vigor and a poor plant stand. So while you're out scouting for other pests, look into the canopy and look for symptomatic stunted plants to keep an eye on hints of viruses. Viruses are a little tricky to scout for because there are multiple different symptoms and it is not easy to relate symptoms to specific viruses. But scan the field for patches of stunted plants with low vigor and plants may have a red or pink hue to them. And we have found that some viruses affect cultivars separately, so you may want to keep an eye on different cultivars. So strawberries infected with one virus do not usually exhibit severe symptoms or have much damage, but it's when there are two or more viruses present where we start to see these concerning severe symptoms, including loss of vigor, stunting, poor growth, leaf modeling, leaf yellowing, red discoloration, leaf distortion where one leaflet is smaller than the others, or poor berry quality. So you can see that some of these virus symptoms are quite severe. So it's important for berry growers to control the vectors, which include aphids and whiteflies. And that's where scouts come in to keep an eye on these pests. So strawberry aphids vector four viruses, the strawberry model virus, strawberry crinkle virus, strawberry mild yellow edge virus, and strawberry vein banding virus. And white flies vector the strawberry pallidosis virus and strawberry polaro virus. So I'll go through a few of these different viruses, but keep in mind that the presence of the symptoms that I'll speak about do not always indicate a virus in the field, and the symptoms cannot always be associated with a particular virus. So as I mentioned, two or more viruses need to be present to see some of those severe symptoms. And a combination of viruses that occur in certain cultivars can affect um, can result in different symptoms. So strawberry model virus is a common virus in Ontario. It is vectored by the strawberry aphid, as I mentioned, and a couple other aphids. Um, and plants infected with strawberry model virus may not show symptoms, but leaves may appear mottled, small, and distorted. And with another virus present, there can be cupped leaves, stunted or distorted leaves, and yellow edges. 
Strawberry crinkle virus is another aphid vectored virus in Ontario. Um, plants infected with strawberry crinkle virus alone may not show symptoms, but in the presence of a second virus, the leaves may appear mottled and crinkled. Strawberry mild yellow edge virus is another aphid vectored virus in Ontario, and similar to the other ones I've mentioned, do not show symptoms when it's affected, uh, infected alone. But when another virus is present, symptoms may include cupped leaves and distorted leaves with yellow edges. Um, so you can start to notice that when I'm describing these viruses, some of the symptoms are similar. And the important thing to remember is that uh, virus uh, symptoms can be different in different combinations of viruses. But the important thing is to notice and recognize that viruses are present and to control the vectors. Strawberry pallidosis virus is another common virus in Ontario that is vectored by the white flies. And when combined with another virus, symptoms can include discolored red or purplish leaves, as shown in this picture. Strawberry vein banding virus is another virus that is vectored, vectored by strawberry aphids, but other aphid species may also vector this virus. And when two or more viruses are present, including strawberry vein banding virus, symptoms may include yellowing between the veins or older leaves may become brown. So I've spoken about some of the symptoms that I, you would expect to see because of viruses in strawberry fields. And we've done a few surveys over the years to understand where viruses were present in Ontario and understand more about aphid management. So in 2014 is when aphid management really began. Uh, once we understood what was causing these viruses and resulting in low vigor and lower yields. So we did a virus survey in 2015 where six strawberry farms across Ontario were surveyed for strawberry viruses. And then in 2016, 2017, we began hearing anecdotally that fields were lasting longer and potentially aphid management was working because we were not seeing the same effects of viruses um, after a few years of um, aphid management. So then in 2017, we surveyed the same six strawberry farms to evaluate the amount of viruses on their farms and see if anything had changed in those last two years. So here are the results of those strawberry virus surveys. The first one in 2015 on the left with the solid virus and then the 2017 results on the right. And you can see that in 2017 we did ID all five viruses again. However, the mean was slightly down in 2017, although not significantly. Uh, strawberry model virus was detected the most frequently in, in 2017, followed by strawberry vein banding virus and strawberry polaro virus. But you can see that in strawberry vein banding virus and strawberry mild yellow edge virus, these two, uh, these two viruses on the left uh, did decline in 2017 compared to 2015. And both of these viruses are aphid transmitted. And so we think that the decline of these two viruses may be due to better control of the strawberry aphid vector. However, the reason for the increase in some of those other viruses, uh, strawberry model virus and strawberry polaro virus, which are vectored by aphids, is unclear. And then strawberry pallidosis virus uh, in all fields compared, was found in all fields compared to 15% of fields in 2015. And this virus is vectored by white flies. So maybe white flies are another pest that we need to monitor for and to manage. So as I've mentioned a couple times, the number of viruses is important. So when only one virus is present, you're less likely to see symptoms. But when two or more viruses are present is when you're likely to see those severe symptoms of reduced yield and reduced vigor. And so this is an interesting graph from the 2015 and 2017 survey. And you can see that the incidence of plants infected with more than one virus declined at five of the six farms, which is promising. And 20% of all, of all samples taken in 2017 had more than one virus present, compared to 27% in 2015. So this suggests that the IPM strategy is having a positive effect on virus management and strawberry production, but growers need to stay vigilant in controlling aphids, and scouts need to make sure that they are monitoring for aphids so that growers can control them effectively. This survey determined the level of strawberry viruses in Ontario, and to determine that aphid management was having a positive effect on the amount of strawberry viruses, but that the incidence of strawberry virus um, has not decreased as much as anticipated, so vigilant aphid management and monitoring is still needed to control strawberry viruses. If you suspect virus on the farms you are scouting, 
Uh, you can send samples into a diagnostic lab. Make sure you take systematic samples. And the Pest Diagnostic Clinic now has the capacity to test for multiple different raspberry and strawberry viruses. So one last note on strawberry virus vectors, the strawberry aphid. I will discuss strawberry aphids more in the live webinar on May 12th. So register for that before, so register for that to learn more about strawberry aphid monitoring or check out that video. But for now, I just wanted to show a couple pictures. So this one on the right, where you can see a close-up of the strawberry aphid and the knobbed hairs, which distinguish the aphid from other aphids that you may find. When we did a survey of aphids present in strawberry fields, we did find that most of the aphids were strawberry aphids, but other aphids can be present as well. And then this photo on the top left is of where you're going to find the strawberry aphids on these young folded second leaves on the underside of them. So when you're scouting, that's what you're going to be looking for. And then the winged form of the aphid is in this bottom left photo, and that's the stage that we're trying to control because these aphids will fly to healthy plants or to new healthy fields and spread the virus to other fields. That concludes the information on strawberry viruses, strawberry fruit rots, and leaf diseases. I have a couple of resources I encourage you to check out, including our OnFruit blog, which you can see here at onfruit.ca, where we post regular information on crop and pest management. And be sure to check out our crop IPM website, which has multiple modules of different crops, including strawberries and raspberries. And there's a lot of information on the, dise on the diseases I discussed today, including pictures and descriptions that will help you diagnose what you are seeing in the field. Thank you for watching this presentation on strawberry leaf diseases, fruit rots, and viruses. My contact information is on this slide if you have any questions or wish to contact me.